difficult, if not the most difficult passages to understand in Paul's writings. As Terry was saying before we got started, it sounds a bit like Flip Wilson. The devil made me do it. And obviously, as Terry said, that's not what Paul meant, but it's too easy a conclusion. Um, it's just laying off. Well, that's not what's going on here, but I will, before we read a word, um, the argument is who is speaking at verse 15? The Eastern Church and the scholars of the 20th century said that uh, Paul was using this first person present tense argument to speak for a hypothetical unsaved person. It's there's someone before salvation that God is working through uh, prevenient grace, as a Methodist would say, to draw, you know, it's just pre-conversion. Now, that's the Eastern Church, that's the 20th century. It doesn't seem to hold up water for several reasons. One is that Paul is using first person present tense. I, I'm talking about today. And the thing about Paul is that when he spoke of his past, he bragged on it. He claimed he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, under the law, perfect. <laughs> that sure doesn't sound like what's being said here today. Uh, I'm reminded of, of the old saying that if you don't meet the devil on the road, you're going in the same direction. And how often, how frequently someone comes to Christ that I'm aware of, and only after they take a stand for Christ do they, in fact, uh, run into true trials. Mm -hmm. Something else is going on, and I'm going to go ahead and give you my take on it before we even look at the text. Last week in Bible study uh, at Parsons, one of the most saintly people I know of this county confessed trouble with her mouth, speaking things that she shouldn't speak. Could have blown me away because this is a person whom I highly respect and, and want to emulate, want to be like. And then I remembered what it is to live in Christ. And the illustration I used um, I asked the ladies, it was all women last week at Parsons, I asked the ladies, I said, have y'all got a makeup mirror that's got glass on, on both sides? And they acknowledged that pretty much every one of them had a makeup mirror somewhere, a small portable makeup mirror, and it had mirror on two sides. I said, now on one side, it's just a normal mirror. What happens when you flip that and look at the other mirror? It magnifies. I said, what happens is that as Christ dwells in you, what used to not bother you is magnified to the point that it becomes this horrible thing. I think personally that's the answer. Uh, and, and it's not just based on this, it's, it's based on, on Scripture uh, elsewhere. Um, Hebrews talks about those whom the Lord loves, He chastens. The correction of the Lord is almost foolproof diagnosis that you belong to Him. He doesn't chasten, He doesn't correct. And one of the corrections of the Lord is just bringing us into knowledge of what pleases God and what displeases God. And, and, um, and so you've got this idea that uh, uh, as you draw closer to Christ, that which would never bother you in the past suddenly becomes humongous and you find yourself uh, apologizing and repenting for things that you wouldn't even consider. Um, that, that is part of an introduction. Um, it seems like what we've got here is this ongoing process of sanctification. We're, we're saved as soon as we receive 
Christ's salvation in us. It's offered without cost and it's free, but from that point in time onward, we've got this process of sanctification and it's ongoing. It's, it's, it's a work. Uh, it's not solely me, it's a partnership between God, the community of faith, and myself. Um, but it is a work. And uh, to give background at verse 12, you've got this idea, uh, therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good has then what is good become death to me, verse 13. So in other words, uh, is it law that brings death? That's, that's a background setting. Is it law that brings death? Well, certainly not. But sin, that it may appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandments might become exceedingly sinful. The commandments, the law, is that which God gives. In a moment, he's going to call it holy. For we know the law is spiritual. It's, it's holy. Why is it spiritual? It's given by God. It's, it's inspired. You know, God gave it on, on the mountain uh, to Moses. It's, it's God given these commandments. Uh, the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. I am uh, fleshly. Um, I'm part of the fallen. Now, we pick up with our verse today. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, now again, hear the, the first person present tense. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. And let's pause and pray. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Christ become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our redeemer. Amen. Sometimes you hear people talk about carnal Christians or fleshly Christians. Um, you might think of this person as immature. I go back to what I said earlier that the closer you draw to Christ, the more the sin is brought to mind. It's not that it's magnified, it's that your vision is clarified and you understand really how bad it is. Now this is not of Christ, or not Christian in origin, Mohandas K. Gandhi, who was given the title Mahatma, great soul, said that the uh, burdens of a Mahatma belong to a Mahatma. They, that, you know, only, only, well, my point is that only someone who is trying to live in Christ understands what it is to face these problems. Uh, I don't want to take the easy way out and just say the devil made me do it. Uh, but notice when he's talking this way, he uses I and it's first person. And, and for me, that's a hint that he's talking about doing it under his own ability. Doing, he's trying to obey the will of God as God reveals it through Scripture, through other believers, directly by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. However God gives it, God gives it. And then Paul turns around and talks about I. I, I, I. It seems to me that all of this is an introduction to chapter 8 where Paul talks in chapter 8 about the Holy Spirit. 21 times, 21 times in chapter 8, he introduces the Holy Spirit. 21 times. Chapter 7, he talks a lot about I. It seems to me, and this is a summation sentence, it seems to me that the answer is surrender. <laughs> Don't try to do it yourself. Let God do it in you, as Paul will say elsewhere in 2 Corinthians 12, at verse 10, when I am weak, then I am strong. Uh, when I'm in my own strength, I'm weak. I'm going to fail. And I think that's what's being introduced here. 
uh, verse 15 again, for what I am doing, I do not understand. He's a mystery to himself. What, what's going on here? You know, I accept Jesus Christ as Savior. I, I understand the will of God for the first time in my life, at least partially, and yet I don't understand for what I will to do. That I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Again, it's the idea, I'm a mystery to myself. How in the world is this happening? I, 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 I have at least partial understanding of the will of God, a beginner's knowledge, and yet it's just like knowing the will of God becomes the exact opposite of doing the will of God. I, I'm a mystery. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree that it is I agree with the law that it is good. Why is the law good if I will not to do? If I do what I will not to do? Well, the law restrains. The law judges. The law convinces me I need help. I think it's that third one more than anything. I can't do it on my own. I, I, I I need help. One of the illustrations for me that's the clearest in a concrete manner is how this social isolation has affected the people in the uh, addiction community because they can't go to the meetings. They don't have uh, the, the power of the small group. And, and, and uh, I hear it, uh, you know, we, we we have two different types of small group at the Parsons Church, uh, AA and NA, and uh, you know we open our doors three times a week to assist. And, and for a long period of time there, we were telling those groups don't meet. And then I was hearing back from very credible sources, we're dying out here. You need help. Now, for AANA, the group itself becomes help, but I think that's a pale imitation of the body of Christ, what we get in church. I think the real thing is the body of Christ, or the more real thing, because we have the presence of God. But I agree the law is good. It, 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 it shows me my need for more, but now it also restrains. One of the problems that I have with the... Uh, the tearing down of the statues, and it's gotten ridiculous because they're tearing down statues of uh, uh, anti-slavery heroes of the faith and just all kinds of craziness. But what they're doing is they're cutting any ties to, to our history, to our past, and that includes the Judeo-Christian standard of right and wrong. And so we're trying to have a system of right and wrong totally devoid of, devoid of any connection to, to Bible. The law is good. One of the things it does is even if you're not a Christian or a Jew, if you have no knowledge, you have some sense of right and wrong just based on the community you live in. Murder is bad. Theft is bad. Uh, adultery, bad. Just right and wrong comes with us through our society. That's the work of the law. I and, <laughs> when lying was bad. Anyway, I'm not touching that line. 17 is the hopelessness that, that Paul feels. It's like there's an alien power at work inside him. It's the, the, the power is not outside him, it's, it's inside him. But now it is no longer I who do it but sin that dwells in me. Is he saying I'm possessed? No, but it sounds very similar. Um, it is the fleshly, carnal nature. Original sin. Original sin, and it doesn't go away. I'm going to just jump into my main point here. As long as we're in the flesh, up until we get our glorified body, this is going to be a problem. Bodily resurrection is so overlooked in Christian theology today. You know, we say every week in the Apostles' Creed, 
a creed. I believe in the resurrection of the body. And yet, we don't really understand what that means. Uh, my favorite passage in that, from 1 Thessalonians 4, I want you to compare the thought of 4b and 6b, just as soon as I find the passage that has been previously marked and somehow jumped out, and I'm now killing time. 4b and 6b on 1 Thessalonians 4, and explain this to me. Uh, not 4, 14 and 16. I said 4 and 6. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 14b, halfway through. And then 16b, halfway through. So God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. I'll go ahead and give you this. Sleep means die. He's just being a pastor there. Uh, Jesus died, rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So if you're dead, uh, Jesus comes the second time and uh, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. 16b, and the dead in Christ will rise first. <laughs> you explain it. Which is it? Is it 14b or 16b? Does he, do they come with Jesus or do they come out of the ground? Yes. <laughs> what is placed in heaven? Call it our spirit. What, whatever it is that's placed in heaven that is us at the moment of our conversion is kept in heaven until Jesus comes again. But our body is planted, as the cemetery said one time in a church cemetery, saints planted as seeds, just wait till we bloom. Jesus comes, the spirit of all that die in Jesus come with him. God sees that. Father takes care of that. And then our bodies come out of the grave. But it's not the old body, it's the new body glorified. And, and 1 Corinthians 15 at 23 following goes into that in great detail. But, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And so the bodies come up out of the ground and yet it's, it's not a zombie. Y'all realize that most of the horror movies are based in trying to come up with a Christian theme without Christ. The zombie is the dead in Christ rising first, and the idea of the vampire is eternal life rooted in the blood. And uh, I mean, just anyway, it goes on and on. But you've got this idea that until we get the glorified body, if we're on this earth, yes. Our spirit is safe in heaven with Jesus, and it will come again with Jesus. The Father will see to that. But for now, we've still got that unglorified, unresurrected body. And I don't want to say the two things are different, but death means the two things are separated. It's the inner versus the outer. Um, Talk about the resurrected body just a second. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Now, uh, 42 introduces, so is also the resurrection of the dead. I'm going to skip down from 42. I said 24 earlier. I got my numbers backwards. 42. Now skip down to verse 50. Now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Um. Uh, it takes more than flesh and blood. That's of this earth. That's of this creation. It'll take the resurrected body. If flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. All right, pause there. Last trumpet. Somebody give me that one. What's the last trumpet? From Revelation. Revelation. 
It's the return of Jesus. It's the second coming. Every eye will see, every tongue confess. It's the last trump. Uh, it's funny, uh, Jewish uh, theology has uh, uh, the ram that was provided as a sacrifice to Abraham so that he doesn't have to sacrifice Isaac. He, he, you know, he has one trumpet that he gives to Abraham and the other one he gives to Gabriel and says, hold on, I'll tell you when to blow it. That's, that's, I'm serious. That's Jewish mythology. You know, hang on, just hold on to that. I'll tell you when. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. This is what inherits the kingdom of God. Yes, part of us right now, as Paul has said elsewhere, part of us already dwells in the presence of God. We're seated with Christ in heaven. But the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this, corrupt, cor for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. And it goes on and it goes on. What Paul is talking about here in Romans 7 is talking about our pre-resurrected body, our, our fleshly. And that's one of the reasons he uses this word fleshly so much. It's of this earth. It's of this creation. It's, it's yes, our, our, our uh, spirit is redeemed and it's seated with Christ in heavenly places. But at the same time, we still dwell in this mortal body. And, 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 and yes, the closer we draw to Christ, the more our sin bothers us. But there's a point, 1 John 2, verse 1, the great apostle, my dear little children, don't sin. But when you do... <laughs> You have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ. I mean, there's a point to it. We have our oops. Even we Methodists who still to this moment, even if we don't believe it, uh, require at ordination an oath that I will attempt to go on to perfection in this life. Do not understand perfection to be of performance, but of love. That God's love will dwell perfectly in me to full completion. It's, you know, yes, I'm still going to have the moments where uh, there's not an alignment with what I love and what I want with what I do, but that doesn't prevent, prevent me from going on to perfection, as Wesley would say. Six, uh, 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. So there you go. In the flesh, nothing good dwells. That flesh is part of the first creation. It's not the redeemed creation. It's, it's, it's as I am now, and I'm surrounded by fleshliness, earthliness. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. I ran across some quotes from Mr. Wesley <laughs> when uh, he was in Savannah as a missionary. He, uh, he would repeat uh, 15 and following, uh, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. He would quote this entire passage to himself, saying in his journal that he's beating his fists in the air repeating this passage with this, with this commentary that uh, uh, before I had willingly served sin, before I had willingly served sin, but now it was unwillingly, but I still served it. <laughs> People want to say that he got saved at his Aldersgate experience. I, I don't believe in works righteousness. I, I think God was dealing with Wesley like this. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been so tormented about his sin. You know, it's that torment about his sin that makes me believe he 
was already belonging to God in Christ at that moment. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And that's the part that Terry's comment about uh, Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it. You can too easily just, oh, that's, that's sin, that's not me. People will sometimes say after they do something they regret, that wasn't me, or about someone else. That wasn't. Today they say, that's not who I am. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you see that in print all the time after somebody's arrested or that's, oh, not, that's not who I That's not who I am. <laughs> and you want to ask, well, who is it? <laughs> well, this is the unregenerate body that belongs to this creation. I, I don't want to be dualistic there that you can't separate, but we're not fully redeemed. And, and that's the key point. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. The law of my mind is that delight in the law of God. Let me repeat that. At 22, you've got, I delight in the law of God. And that delighting in the law of God is what he refers to in 23 as the law of my mind. That's the same thing. But at 23a, there's another law. And it wars against the law that delights in the law of God. And it brings me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I still say the answer is surrender. It's not working harder. It's surrendering to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and receiving the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And yes, one of the side effects, I believe, is that your sin that you continue in in practice becomes more evil to you. You, re you recognize it's evil. It, it becomes more of a curse to you. Uh, the actual practice of it becomes less, but the, the weight of it weighs heavier. And I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This introduces then uh, the Holy Spirit work in a, a person mentioned 21 times in the next chapter. Um, I think that is a good introduction to that passage. What comments have we got on this? Terry, did I stay away from the devil made me do it? <laughs> yeah, uh, Paul's, I've been in this argument since I was in college. Uh, one of my, we had a suite of rooms that shared a bathroom and one of the guys in the next room that shared the bathroom, we would get into these. And the guy was learned about this Bible as a non-believer better than me probably at the time but he could go through and point out Paul's contradictions there and argue extremely well against it and me I'm sitting there trying to figure out how am I going to tell this guy he's, he's, he's missing the point I hope he got the point because he did spend a lot of time at it and I never did run across him again after I graduated I always wanted to know how he made out and we would debate that no, nothing in anger or anything no 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 but, but we would debate it and and I kept, I'm afraid I lost a lot of those debates but you're still in the Lord serving the kingdom yeah so it sounds like you may have lost a battle and won the war yeah <laughs> 
Uh, my mother wouldn't have let me lost the war. <laughs> now, finally, it's your choice, brother. Finally, <laughs> finally, you have to, yeah, you yeah. have to stand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's it, it's a problem of if the only time I got to miss church, even, even though I played dance gigs until two o'clock in the morning, drove back from Daytona Beach to Orlando, didn't get to bed to four o'clock. When seven o'clock came. A, Round, you had to be up. You had to go to church, <laughs> and it didn't. The only excuse was that your temperature was over 102. <laughs> so when I got to college there by myself, I missed the first week, and I didn't know what to do with myself. There you go. And so there wasn't a church nearby. There wasn't a method. There wasn't any church. South Florida was way out in the middle of the boondocks, and I was without. Transport. The only thing I had was a bicycle, and it was 15 miles to the nearest Methodist church. I'm going to ride 15 miles and get sweaty in Florida <laughs> sunshine to go to church. Uh, and I discovered that they had a chapel service in the morning. It was 9 o'clock in the morning, so the preacher came in. There were three churches that shared. There was a Presbyterian, a Methodist, and a Get the other one, uh, Church of God or somebody. I forget. They, they rotate the, pre the preachers around, and I got myself up and went to church. <laughs> it was 30 minutes, but it <laughs> there's an old saying in West Tennessee: every kettle sits on its own bottom. Yeah, <laughs> I heard that one from <laughs> from my mentor in law <laughs> when I was going to law school. Mm -hmm. What were you going to say, Jim? <laughs> explanation of these last few verses reminded me of a little flat things that Charles Wilson gave us at the last men's breakfast, talking about prayer, that it says uh, uh, prayer is hard work, but prayer works. Mm -hmm. Prayer is work, but prayer works. Prayer works. And, you know, that's exactly, I think, what, what Paul's saying. Maybe you just got to keep on keeping up. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to magically go away. No, no. It's part, it's part of that process, and I think the process is there intentionally. I think the pro process is the will of God. Well, it says there, too, that it says, I know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Now, he's not talking about being unsafe there, is he? He's talking about just being... No, uh, but, but he's talking about his struggle. Right. You know, we all have that struggle. We, we have that struggle, and, and again, my take on the passage is that uh, the struggle increases after salvation. It doesn't, right. you know, and that's more aware. More aware. And, the, and the law makes us more aware of mm -hmm. what we're doing wrong. But it, but it also is a situation that then we become enemies of the God of this world. Yeah. And that's just as real as can be. We ready to pray? Mm -hmm. Father, it's good to be in your house to know your presence. We pray, Lord, that as we disperse, we go in the power of your Holy Spirit to live as your children and to see the kingdom come. In Jesus' name, amen.